Good morning. It's good to have you with us again today. We are moving towards the end of Revelation. We are at the end of chapter 20 today. Last two weeks, last three weeks, we've been looking at the Millennial Kingdom and the promise that the Lord has said is coming a thousand years under the reign of Christ. And then at the end of that thousand years, what we see is ultimately what God has promised all along in the Scripture. Satan is finally defeated, and he's thrown into the lake of fire for all time. Our adversary, our enemy, is defeated finally by Christ. Jesus Christ now is, is on the precipice of bringing all believers into, into a new eternal reality with him. And when you just think about the greatest joys of life, the greatest joys of living... Uh, ultimately, what we will have in Christ is going to supersede all that. It just kind of brings a smile to your face. It brings joy to your heart to think about the reality of what we have in Christ. Then you just turn that coin over and you just think about the hardship of life, the reality of sin, the worst moments you've ever had in your life, the impact of sin on your life, uh, the greatest moments of terror in your life, in our nation, uh, Pearl Harbor, 9-11, civil war, wars of all kind, whatever that might be, personal moments of terror, whatever that might be. We have those two things, uh, that, that parallel going all through Scripture, the reality of sin, the reality of God's grace. Today, as we come to chapter 20 and complete chapter 20, we see Jesus Christ bring a, a completion to sin and all that He promised He would do. We come to what we see as the great white throne here in Revelation chapter 20. Before Jesus brings in the uh, the new heaven or new earth, he, he has to deal with sin one final time. That's what he's going to do today. This is a sobering reality of this message today, this time today we spend together in Revelation. So let's look at that. Let's read the passage first, and then we'll look at it together. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, and from his presence earth and sky fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This has very important reminders for us and maybe new truth for you as we listen this morning. Let's see what God has for us. There's four things I want us to see from this passage that just grab our heart and grab our attention. The first thing that we see is this, is that God's judgment is terror. It is terror to the unbeliever. It is, it is the, the greatest moment of terror that anyone who has ever lived in history will ever face. All unbelievers will face this reality of terror. Why, why is that true? Why is that so? What, is this, what does the text show us? What does the scripture so, show us? What really is going on here? This, this great white throne scene that we have here in Revelation. Well, we see here in verse 11 that, that God is holy. It is a great white throne. It, it communicates clearly as we see Jesus Christ and God the Father here in Revelation in, in His holiness. Often like this, we see simply the purity of who He is. We see the holiness of who He is. And um, we come back to, it just makes, it makes me mindful of what I see in, in Isaiah chapter 6, where it simply is said of God, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of His glory. And that's what we see right here. And Isaiah, who's, who's been ushered into heaven here in this, in this vision before the Lord, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And, and Isaiah expects that he should die there. He's not worthy to be in the presence of God at all. He recognizes he is a sinner before a holy God. And the God extends to him grace, sends a, uh, a cherubim to him, and, and he is told, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. You are covered by, ultimately, my righteousness. 
And we see that that is the necessity of anyone who stands in the presence of God to be covered by the work of Christ, the work of God before them. Daniel chapter 7, upon which Revelation is built here, this book, the book of Daniel, we've gone to Daniel often and many times, reminds us, as I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. And his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. What we catch here is, is the clarity, ultimately, of the holiness of God and who he is. That is the scene that we see here at the great white throne. The purity, the holiness, the righteousness of God, the Father, and of Jesus Christ, his Son. How significant, how important. Psalm chapter 9, the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world. And so we see here, we see here that the throne is a throne of judgment. It's the great white throne judgment. It is God bringing together as the final day of the Lord. Psalm chapter 9, verse 20 says this, Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. God, remind the nations they're just men before a holy God. And he says, Selah, which is, stop and think about that. Meditate on that for a moment. What's the implications of that? What's the importance of that? We're simply men before a, a holy God. We ought to fear our Lord and our God. Isaiah chapter 13 Descriptive, wail, for the day of the Lord is near. Here now it is taking place here in Revelation. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble. Every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another, and their flames will be a fire. Acts chapter 17. He has fixed a day that is this day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. This is the day. This is the moment. And we see this. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. It is ultimately the Father's judgment. It is the Son who carries it out. The Son has always found his greatest pleasure in fulfilling and carrying out the will of his Father. The Father has given Jesus Christ, his Son, all judgment. That's who we see taking place here. And the reality is the holiness of God stands in stark contrast to the scene that unfolds. We see in, in verse 11 the reality, and from his presence earth and sky fled, and no place was found for them. Even creation, as the wrath of God is poured out ultimately with finality, cannot even stand in the presence of God. Um, 2 Peter chapter 3, this passage that many of us know well, the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And then the coming of the day of the Lord this day of the Lord will come because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. You know, uh, basically two thoughts here. Either, either God destroys the heavens and the earth completely and is going to create a brand new heaven and earth or he, or he purges the old heaven and earth and brings a, a, a new clarity to it and transforms it like maybe he does us when we are saved. But the reality is this, heaven and earth as we know it right now cannot exist in the presence of the ultimate wrath of God against sin. And it is dissolved, it burns up. I believe this is literal, I believe it will take place. I believe God destroys the heavens and the earth as we know them and, and after the millennial kingdom and, we will, and the result will then be a new heaven and new earth. We're going to see that as we continue here in Revelation. So the reality is this, is the, is, is the utter holiness of God against the judgment of God. The second thing we see is in verses 12 and 13, every sin will be accounted for after death. Every sin, any sin who is, that has ever been committed by unbelievers will be accounted for here. Man's, man's work will be judged. That's the reality of what we see here in this text. Um, the books are opened. And those books will be uh, according to what, how we are judged. Those books 
will have all of the works that unbelievers have ever done. How significant. Now we need to, now we need to communicate here too. Uh, this is the great white throne. I saw the dead, verse 12. So that gives us a clue right there. It is the dead who are brought before the Lord. They are raised to life. They who were dead are now raised to life. When the millennium began, all who had, who had ever died that were believers were raised to life. Old Testament, New Testament. Tribulation saints were raised to life. Now those who, who are now raised, this is, the, this is the, uh, going to be the second death. It'll be a resurrection of those who are unbelievers raised to stand in judgment before the Lord. And I believe that everyone who is here at this great white throne are those who are being judged as unbelievers before Christ. Man's work, the work of all unbelievers, will be judged at this time. Daniel reminds us, chapter 7, verse 10, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and a thousand thousand served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. See, Revelation gets its clue from what we see here in Daniel, a scene uh, of judgment before God, and God opens the books, and the books have written in them everything that has ever been done by man. That's what we see here. The judger, the dead are judged according to what was written in the books, according to what they had done. How significant. Revelation chapter 11, verse 18, and the nations raged. But your wrath came in the time for the dead to be judged. So the dead are, are raised to life and now are standing before Christ to be judged before Him. John chapter 5 makes it clear that no one's going to be left behind. An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, that's the first resurrection, the beginning of the millennial kingdom, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, that's this resurrection, the great white throne judgment, where unbelievers now stand before the Lord. Sin for all time is now being judged. It was judged at the cross for believers. As we come to Jesus Christ in faith, we receive forgiveness and grace. And our sin is covered by the work of Jesus Christ. Now these who are raised to life are unbelievers that stand before Christ unprotected. We're going to see why. There is an individual accountability, Romans 14. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Every one of us individually will not be passed by, skipped over, forgotten, minimized. God's going to look with clarity at your life, my life. Those who are unbelievers, he will look at the life of every unbeliever there. Not believers. That was done at the judgment seat of Christ, the beam of seat of Christ during the tribulation. That work has been done. That prepared the church to become ultimately the bride of Christ who was presented. And that marriage feast, that marriage supper of the Lamb was, was carried out and enjoyed by the church and all believers. Hebrews 14, no creature is hidden from his sight. All are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Ultimately, we all give an account. But here, unbelievers now stand for him unprotected by the grace of God. As a believer, I will give an account. But I stand before the Lord, and I will stand, and you will stand as a believer in Christ, protected by the grace of God, given reward ultimately for our faithfulness to him. Here, all unbelievers will stand accountable to Christ, unprotected because they have not received the grace of God. Their offense, oppressing God's truth, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who, because of and by that unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. They were ungodly because they suppressed the truth, the treasures of God's word on their life. Hebrews chapter 10, the offense, deliberately sinning. If we go on del sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of God's word, the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Even the sacrifice of Christ on the cross no longer has effect when I ultimately uh, choose to reject his work on my behalf. But there is then only a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury of fire that will consume his adversaries. Every unbeliever will stand unprotected from the judgment that will take place. The offense, a hard heart. 
Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. Romans 2. Because we are self-seeking, we live for ourselves, not for him. For those who are self-seeking, because of that, they do not obey the truth. They obey unrighteousness, and there will be wrath and fury. God is going to pour out his fury, his wrath on unbelievers because of the reality of sin in their life, and ultimately because of the rejection of grace. How much worse do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has ultimately outraged the Spirit of grace? Every unbeliever who will stand here before Christ is without excuse. Every unbeliever who stands here before Christ has ultimately rejected the Spirit of grace, has outraged the grace that God extended over and over again to every believer, every unbeliever. Our Lord has extended grace to everyone who has ever lived. And those who will stand here before the great white throne will have over and over again rejected that grace, rejected the truth of the Son of God. Now at this judgment, distinctions will be made. Scripture seems to make that clear to us. The works that are being judged, there will be distinctions made by Christ as He judges us. All of that work will be judged in the life of an unbeliever. But it's important to understand that this is also true. Matthew chapter 10, If anyone, as the disciples go out and share the gospel, if anyone will not receive you, or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or that town. Truly I say to you, it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah and the horrible sin that they were guilty of, homosexuality, all kind of sins against God, than for that town. There is a distinction made by Christ that this town, these people, because Jesus Christ is present among the people themselves, the Messiah is here now there will be a greater condemnation. There is a distinction in, in the, uh, the severity of the punish, punishment of God in hell for unbelievers, and only God is only Christ is able to make that distinction. We cannot possibly make that distinction. Mark chapter 12, Jesus said in his teaching, Beware of the scribes, religious folk, and the Jewish leaders, who would, would like to walk around in long robes, like greetings in the marketplaces, have the best seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at all the feasts, they devour widows' houses, and for pretense they make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. To, to, to have religion be the cloak of your life, to have goodness be the cloak of your life, but inwardly to be corrupt, to be dark, to, to have motives that are driven by self, God says they will receive the greater condemnation. There are levels of severity of punishment just as there are differences of reward for believers who walk with Christ but here's the key the works that are judged are not a matter of salvation we're not saved by works I want you to understand that as the Lord opens the books and judges our works we ultimately are not cast away because of our work Okay. The works reveal whether salvation is true and real. The works or lack of work reveals whether we have a genuine relationship with Christ or not. The body of work in your life ultimately reveals whether your faith in Christ is real and genuine. If the work of your life is contrary to the profession of faith in your life, then Jesus Christ will know the distinction. He will know the difference. He may say to you, depart from me, I never knew you even though you did all of the things that are a part of Christianity. Talk about that in a second. Ephesians 2 makes it, makes it very careful. We're saved by grace. We're saved by faith, not of works. You need to understand that. Salvation is, is by faith alone. It's not by works. Jesus, as he judges the works, ultimately is distinguishing the lack of relationship. That's the key. We are saved through his work. He saved us not because of our works done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. By the washing of regeneration, the renewal of the Holy Spirit. It's because of His work in your heart and mind. Number three, verses 12 and 15, we see this reality as well. Man's relationship to Christ will be the determining factor, not the works. The works will reveal a lack of this reality, though. The works will reveal a lack of relationship. 
But what separates all who are here before the great white throne is a lack of relationship with Christ, a lack of faith in Christ. That is really important to see and to understand. Another book was open. So you have the books. Jesus is judging all of the work of the life of an unbeliever. But then in verse 12, another book was opened, which is the book of life. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, we're going to see the, we're going to see the result. There is the book of life. Ultimately, that book is the book that separates believer from unbeliever. Not the books of our works. Those, those judgments determine the severity of our punishment in hell. This book determines our relationship or lack of relationship with Jesus Christ. It is, the, it is on the basis of my name, a person's name not being written in this book, where we are judged and we are thrown into the lake of fire. This is, this is, the, this is the key right here. This is, this is the essential moment right here when this book is open. It is the book of life. How important to know and to understand that. We see in Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, the one who conquers, the one who is an overcomer, I will never, ever blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Once we know Jesus Christ as Savior, confess him as Savior by faith, genuine faith, we can never be taken out of the book of life. We can never be unsaved. This is eternal security. This is assurance of salvation. This is all of that. But Jesus says clearly, if, if an, for the unbeliever who is standing before the great white throne, the book will be opened and their name will not be in that book. That is the book that determines their ultimate destiny. The unbeliever, Scripture writes here in Revelation 13, 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship the false prophet, the Antichrist. Everyone whose name had not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. The book of life is the key. It is a part of the sovereign plan of God, the sovereign love and grace of God. Chapter 21, verse 27, the new heaven and new earth, nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's a matter of faith. John 3 tells us this clearly. Whoever does not believe in Christ is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. He shall not see life because the wrath of God remains on him. It's the reality here. The fourth reality is this. There's four pieces. This is the fourth piece. You see this is in verses 14 and 15. There is an eternal consequence for unbelief. All who will stand here at the great white throne will face a consequence and it will be eternal. This is terrifying in every way. Sinners are called out by their work. What devastating, what devastating examination this is. But then to hear the, the ultimate and final determination. For the believer, what we desire to hear, pray to hear, serve him that we might hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, will not be the declaration of the Lord here. It will be, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. He will destroy the enemy. This is the final destruction of the final enemy against him. 1 Corinthians, then comes the end. When he delivers, when Jesus Christ delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after he's destroyed every rule, every authority and power, he must reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the second death. He will throw death into the lake of fire. And as he, what he throws into the lake of fire will be sinners. He will destroy, and he has destroyed sin and now death. And the final destruction of all time of history has taken place here. He has that authority, Revelation 1. We see Jesus Christ presented to us. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Death is the consequence of sin, and Hades is where we go when we die. It is broad, it is wide, it's believer, unbeliever. Now, because the first resurrection has taken place, believers have been resurrected of all time. Now, this is the second resurrection, so unbelievers are now brought from Hades. This is the resurrection of death and Hades. Jesus Christ has the authority over all who have ever died. That is the key to understand. And so we see here in, in verse 5 of chapter 20, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's the reality of what we have here. It is the lake of fire. 
If anyone's name was not found written in the book, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Folks, this is a literal this is a literal punishment. This is a literal hell. This is a literal reality. It is literal punishment from, from God. It is for all eternity. It is a separation of man from God for all eternity. It is man in his sin being thrown into, into a place without any hope, without any power to change. Folks, it is the worst kind of, of reality. You and I don't want anyone to ever have to face the reality of this, and yet millions die all the time. People are dying every day who are going into the, the reality of this eternity for them. Folks, it's beyond comprehension. What does this mean to us? What, what, what are the ramifications of this text? There are so many, but we'll just mention just a few. This is just sobering to, to realize that, that there is, a, there is a, going to be a moment in time, the final ultimate day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ will, will bring all unbelievers of all time and they will stand before Him in judgment. And they, and they will absolutely be judged and, and thrown into an eternal lake of fire. And their sin will condemn them. And their lack of relationship will condemn them. And there will be no excuses. And, you know, many unbelievers say, well, when I, when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Because you know what? Life is hard. And, and unbelievers go through great adversity and great turmoil and don't understand. And yet God says that, that all of us are without excuse. And God says that all of us have been given grace and moments of grace to see God. And he will, he will condemn every unbeliever as an individual who has rejected ultimately the grace of his salvation. That is very sobering. And so I think there are just some final things that we need to keep in our mind as we, as we look at this reality in this text, the Great White Throne. John chapter 5 just reminds us you need to put your faith in Christ. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears the word of God, my word, and believes him who sent me has eternal life. That's the promise. That's just the direct opposite of what we see in this text. And he does not come into judgment. This scene here is all about judgment. There is no grace here. It is non-existent here. But he has passed from death into life. This scene is only death. It is death. It is a resurrection from death to death. It is a resurrection um, from a holding place that is prepared for judgment to come, and then judgment takes place for all eternity. It's, a, it's an unbeliever simply receiving a, a new body to, to experience the reality of hell and punishment for all time. Folks, it's, it's a terrifying reality. It doesn't have to take place. The Lord calls you to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You know, the beautiful thing, when I, I preach Revelation, I preach the Gospel. It, it, it just... It, the reality of hell is so sobering, it's hard to preach. And yet the Word of God places it clearly in His Word, and over and over and over and over again, He speaks to the reality of the need for a Savior. And He makes provision in grace so that every unbeliever might have an opportunity to receive grace, to receive mercy, to step into a relationship, to be forgiven for their sins. There's no forgiveness here. There's no cleansing here. There's no washing here. There's no grace. There's no mercy. There's no second chance. There is none of that. That is behind. That is in the past. When they died, it was over. But the beauty of the gospel is, yes, there's judgment coming, but there is a Savior. There is a, there is a provider. There is provision made for your sin, if you're listening. So we're called to be right with God, to, to step into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians, we're called to be ambassadors Christ we're, to, we're called to be reconciled to God be be right with God call others to be right with God if you're going to be an ambassador for Christ if you're going to represent Christ in your life it is imperative that you are right with God it's an imperative that you walk with the Lord and he calls us we, in view of this great white throne we are to be right with God so we can make an impact on people who need the Lord if our life does not convey Christ then our impact will be minimal at best. We need to be living so that Christ is powerfully demonstrated in our life and in our walk. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 reminds us, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. We are, we are to have a passion to be persuading others, of course, in the wisdom of God, 
under the leading of the Holy Spirit. It's not us who save others. I've never saved anyone in my life. I've had the privilege of leading someone to Christ because the Spirit of God did the work in his heart. I've had the privilege and blessing of seeing that multiple times. And I trust you have too. But it's never of us. God uses us. He gives us that blessing. It's always the work of the Spirit of God. We need to persuade others, though. We need to be a mouthpiece for God. We need to present the truth, live the truth, be that ambassador for Jesus Christ. And we need to be persuaded in our own heart and mind. But what we are is known to God. He knows. And I hope, Paul, I hope, Paul writes, it is known to your conscience. Paul says, I hope that you, and I say this to you, and the Scripture says this to me, I hope you have the confidence, the assurance of where you stand in Jesus Christ. Because the Word of God gives you that confidence. The Spirit of God gives you that confidence. Paul says, I trust you have that. Because if you do, your faith is genuine, your faith is real. Be persuaded and persuade others. With grace, with love, but with boldness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're to be burdened for the lost. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, He will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. We need to have a burden for lost people. We need to look at people. We need to look at our neighbors. We need to look at people that we encounter. We need to see them through the eyes of Christ. We simply need to understand as we uh, rub shoulders with people that we're rubbing shoulders with simply people who need the Lord. It doesn't matter what their relationship is to us, if they are over us, under us, enemies of ours, friends of ours. We need to understand that everyone we rub shoulders with has an eternal destiny. And we need to pray that God just gives us an opportunity in the lives of, of multiple people to be a, a, an ambassador for Christ, and to share Jesus Christ. And we are to live for eternity. Second Peter. Second Peter 3 showed us the heavens and earth being destroyed. They're going to be replaced by a new heaven and earth. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, since this is going to happen, what sort of people ought you to be in, the, in lives of holiness and godliness? But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. That's, that's just the reality of what's coming. For the believer, it's, it's this. It's the reality of heaven and earth. It's reality of the presence of God. It's the reality of, of being holy before God, of, of being right with God. It's the reality of all the promises of, of God fulfilled in Christ on our behalf. As we think of the great white throne, it just reminds us you need a Savior. We need to share that Savior. We need to live in view of, of tomorrow. As you look at people in your life, look at them through the eyes of Jesus Christ. Have a burden for people, even the ones who make your life miserable, especially for them. Ask God to give you a heart of grace and a heart of love for people. Because you know what? People that, people that lash out and people that make your life difficult and people that are unpleasant to be around, just remember, they are that way because of the experiences of life. But they're that way ultimately because of the impact of sin. They're that way because we follow our Father. An unbeliever follows ultimately the, the character qualities of Satan. The believer is to follow the character of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. We encounter those who who are just so difficult and so hard to, to encounter and get along with, we need to remember, they need a Savior. They need the grace of God in their life. They need the transformation that only Christ can be can bring. Hasn't your life been transformed? Hasn't your life changed? Is it changing? Is it being transformed? Do you see God's grace just being uh, energy and nourishment in your life every day? What God is giving to you, what He has given to you, others need they need, the, they need the blessing of what God has given to you. They need to experience the grace that you are experiencing. Pray that God will give you a heart for people who need the Lord. And so that we can have the blessing when we stand before the Lord, not at the great white throne, but at the behemoth seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And as He calls us to, to examination, that He will reward because of our faithfulness to Him. He will reward because we have... We have brought others to Him. 
because of His work, they have received Jesus Christ by faith. And we've had the blessing of being part of that. And God, use your life to accomplish that, to be that, to value that, to care for that. Ask God to make your heart more burdened for people who need the Lord. Thanks for joining us. Take this, take this passage deep into your heart. Pray it over your heart. Ask God to give you a burden for people. And then ask God to help you act on that burden and be proactive and to share. May God bless you as He touches your heart. We'll see you next week.